So, good afternoon and a very warm welcome to everybody. Uh, and welcome to the book launch of Introduction to People Analytics by Nadim Khan and Dave Milner. I'm Max Bloomberg, a People Analytics professor, consultant, and media personality. And it's my absolute pleasure to welcome Nadim and Dave to talk about their book and some of the findings and observations about HR and indeed people analytics today. Nadim and Dave have written an incredibly accessible and non-technical book for HR and related professionals about people analytics. The book covers four themes, why HR has to change, which is something I think that all of us in our hearts knows has to happen, but we're looking for some direction on it. Commerciality and data approaches, because we do often operate in a commercial environment. Case studies, which we know you all love, based around people analytics capable, capability, oh, too much, around the people analytics capability model, which you'll be very free to use. It's and easier to use than to say, Max, honest. Much easier to use yeah. than to say. Yeah. And finally, some tips for um, those of you looking to the future and for it, your careers in people analytics. So let's face it, we are operating in exceptional times and hence this virtual book launch is being tried out by the guys. Um, to outline what the book is about, and who knows, we may even have some follow-up sessions if our virtual crowd, that's you, are interested. We'd love your questions and comments in the comments box, so please feel free to ask things as we go along. And in fact, to get us kicked off, uh, why don't you type into the comments box uh, and tell us where you are from? Uh, hello to you, Simon. Lovely to see you uh, in Ashstead in Surrey. Anybody else there? I know we've got quite a few people on. Do feel free and come along with questions as we go along, please. Okay, so let's just do a very quick summary uh, about Nadim and Dave. Uh, Nadim is a futurist and has over a decade of experience in OD consulting, corporate L&D and coaching. Nadim is also a contributor to people management and entrepreneur.com and he is the founder of Optimizer. Hello and welcome to you Nadim. Hi Max, thank you. Pleasure to be here. Lovely. And Dave, Dave is an occupational psychologist and consultant with 30 years experience working across the globe. He's also frequently referenced as one of the most influential HR practitioners to follow on Twitter, where you probably know him better as the HR curator. Hello to you, Dave. Hi, Max. Thank you very much for doing this. And I promise we will pay you at some stage. I can't wait. <laughs> uh, that's the outcome of people analytics, eh? Uh, right. Um, now, Helen Kogan, who is the managing director of Kogan Page Publishers, in fact, wanted to join us for the launch of the book. But uh, conflicts even seem to occur in the virtual world. So she sent a lovely message uh, and she says that we are delighted to be working with Nadim and Dave to help readers start leveraging the power of people data in their organization. This book is particularly timely for HR professionals managing through this period of uncertainty and change as People Analytics provides organizations with the ability to operate in a more agile and strategic way. She also goes on to say that we're also delighted to be celebrating this great addition to our collection of analytics books to equip HR professionals for the demands of the future world of work. So a very uh, warm thank you to you, Helen, for those kind comments and kind words. So let's get into the proper business of the day. guys. Let us know what got you to where you are today. What are your current roles um, and what are your current focuses? Let's kick off with you, Nadim. Thank you. Um, Max, for me, it's always been about finding my passion and now my purpose uh, in life, obviously. Um, from very, very early in my career, academic career, I was fortunate to work with some amazing people who enabled me to venture into corporate L&D, uh, apart from the, the, the thing that I was doing with organizations like, I was working with organizations like Coca-Cola, Every Dennis and Goethe, Parco and State Bank of Pakistan. And although it was great income, but one of the questions that I used to ask was, what is the value that these programs are providing and delivering to the businesses that, that I'm working with? And the importance was that the, uh, the value that the intangibles provide to, to the business. I mean, what I mean to say is the people side of the business. So I think the passion brought me 
to Lancaster University, where I specialized in human capital uh, analytics. And that's where I interviewed you, Max. Uh, hope you remember that. I, re I remember the moment well. And I'm also thinking we're just about to have a, a sort of a, a YouTube bloopers moment as the kids come into the room. Uh, kids are amazing. Yes. I know that you are recording. They will yes. make a line for it. Every right? chance. Every chance. So Indeed. I think today it's, it's safe to say that I've been part of several global recognized initiatives that are revolutionizing both HR people management and the future of work. And that also includes part of the book. So I've been fortunate. Thank you. Excellent. And Dave, how about you? Well, as you can see, I'm, I'm a little bit more worn and wary and grey and whatever. So, uh, but I started. You have a dog rather than kids. Yeah, well, I started in that Western retail corporate banker, which seems a funny place to start, but somehow ended up in HR um, and um, did a lot of work there and then turned into psychologist and consultant, which I've been doing for a while. Um, within that West, I was involved in shifting personnel into HR and that's really where I gained my passion for the for the subject. I guess the, the frustration that 30 years on we're still having some of those same similar conversations. But with the global experiences at PSL, Connexa and then IBM and now obviously as part of my own business HR curator based around the Twitter profile with I think it's about 26,000 people. Um, I sort wow. of focus on workshops and support of HR in the world of digital analytics, design thinking, and basically anything to do with the future of HR. And uh, it, it's great stuff. And I'm, I'm just really keen and, and have a real passion for this subject. You do. You do indeed. And it comes across. So with such diverse backgrounds, how on earth did the two of you meet up, Nadine? I think it was it it, it, it all started from uh, one of the speaking engagements that I was at in Amsterdam in November 2018. Um, Dave was one of the keynote speakers and I was um, ending uh, one of the sessions and we, I think it was just initially a meeting of minds um, over when when the whole conference ended. Um, both and I, both Dave and I are very passionate about HR data and analytics. And I think the clear understanding of what people analytics is and how it adds value we don't find that many people who are really passionate go ahead and actually end up writing a book uh, to contribute to the wider community. So that I think all those things merge together uh, for us to take this leap of writing the book. That's amazing. And it is such a lot of work writing a book. It uh, has been. Truly. You're very brave. You're very brave. I mean, there are quite a few people analytics books starting to appear on the market now. Um, you know, what What made you decide to enter this fray, shall we call it, Dave? Um, you're right. I, and and when you look at the, the world of people analytics, um, it's really a lot of corporates and their HR functions who are doing some great stuff. And, and you know, I, I go to various conferences and I'm wowed by the visualizations and the complexity of their of the work that they've done. But, but I guess I, I've been a bit frustrated that maybe we've scared our HR practitioners with this data science and statistics language. And, and when you reflect back, there are more HR people in smaller organizations than there are in the corporate world. And so we've tried to aim by making this book very accessible by trying to demystify some of the stats messages and focusing on making better insightful decisions. I, I think the book's probably got three two or three pages of, of of tables of numbers within it but but i think the other thing we need to bear in mind is that this isn't just a people analytics book because if we're going to transform hr analytics alone isn't going to do it on its own and so for all the listeners you know who are from istanbul karachi birmingham unit all over the world as i'm looking at the list here um i think we owe it to our employees to to get it right and, and the analytics is a part of that picture, but it is not the complete picture. Excellent. Just a quick one to add on to that, Dave. What, what are, briefly are the other factors that one would need to add to, to create a big picture? Analytics plus? Well, we, we've, we've used a model called the three Ds in, in the book, which is basically saying if we're looking at future proofing the organization, we've, we've found that there are probably three themes that need to be thought of by HR, which is data, the analytics world, design. So how do we 
we believe that to be strategic, we need to focus on the design, the creation of something that's future orientated. And then finally, digital. We need to embrace the digital world and, and not be scared by the technology, but actually use it as a, a lever that enables us to actually say, now I can stop doing all the routine stuff and really do some of the more interesting stuff, which, of course, not necessarily all the HR practitioners may be keen to, to join that. But we, we've got to remember that once all of this crisis has, has cleared, um, the focus will once again be on numbers and costs in organization. And I know where people will look and they're going to look in HR. So we need to get a value proposition for our function pretty damn quick. And I think analytics and data is a small part of helping in that respect. So, so in a sense, it's really interesting, Nadine, that the book is taking a step back from the usual people analytics books that dive straight into the numbers, straight into the techniques and the cookbooks, et cetera. Um, you provide a much broader perspective. Um, so for the people who are listening today, wh why should they buy the book, Nadine? I think for, for starters, uh, just to say that people analytics has been ranked the most sought out skill for HR from now to 2020 would not just cut it short. So the book to should, 20, to 20 to 2020? 20, 2020, 2020, 2022. Right, right. So from today till the next two years, this is the most sought out skill for HR practitioners. Uh, first thing bearing in mind, the book is targeted and, and written for the general HR uh, practitioner. I think that's, that's one of the, and in a comprehensive version where we take you through the whole journey, what people analytics is to understand the whole spectrum uh, as Dave has mentioned, and how we do that, we, we had in mind, the first thing is that uh, the since HR is the custodian of the workforce, our book is basically embrace, enables them to embrace a data-driven culture and uh, a data-driven approach in their uh, daily, um, I'd say, work. And then I think it's, it's about having those simplified case studies uh, that show HR how to move from being re reactive, which we, we always get this, uh, you know, um, question that HR is very reactive and needs to be proactive. So I think we've shown these, uh, how HR can do that. And, and the amazing part is that when Dave and I reached out to organizations, we didn't just call them up. We actually went there. So we went to, we went to organizations like Brompton Bikes. We, uh, we interviewed people and we, we visited uh, people from NHS. Um, I think Dave has also, Dave and I both went on uh, group calls. And um, I think we, every person that we, we reached out to said yes, uh, at this, at the point in time where we had to stop taking, I think we, we had to stop saying, um, um, taking requests for interviews and developing those case studies. And these are real life case studies of the transformation journeys that uh, bigger and smaller organizations are going through uh, it, it, the HR and digital transformation journey. So we've actually mapped those out and also created an amazing model for people that you mentioned early in the start, the people analytics maturity model. Uh, that sounds really of, useful. Uh, yes, that's through the help of uh, tech companies like Cruncher and other tech companies that we've... Uh, Sorry, we've contextualized. Yeah, no, no. Carry on. Yeah, 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 yeah. You worked with. We crunch. basically took research and we've contextualized it by putting all these different real um, case studies, and and enabling HR how to move uh, from being reactive to being proactive. So, in other words, what you're providing is a series, almost of templates, if you like, for readers to say, "Here's a here's a company with a situation or a context or an environment that's." Yes. Similar mine um this is what they did to be successful we could copy some of these ideas for example yes I, I would i would stay away from copying them i would say obviously if if you're intellectually savvy or if you you know the reason why people work with experts like yourself dave and myself is because they want they want us to come in and they want us to help with that journey and i think we've mapped out the journey so there, there are four stages uh for the first stage is initially obviously you're very reactive you just um, what you're doing is reporting on 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 uh, on data. You're not even analyzing any data. So we start from there and we we move up to the journey where you do predictive people analytics, where experts like yourself are in, are are in that field. So I think it's the whole journey, the whole nine yards, which not many people have addressed up this uh, up till this time. Fantastic, and um, Dave, you often talk about 
HR almost being at a bit of a crossroad. There are so many options for the way HR could go. You know, are we a, a pastoral function? You know, you as a psychologist, um, are we an analytics function? Are we a strategic function? Um, what is this whole thing about HR needing to find its way and to create a map going forward then? Because I know that's something you feel quite strongly about. Yeah. We, we reckon, I don't know, we must have done about 750 hours of research for the book, okay? Wow. That's interviews with execs, leaders, focus groups, working with HR people, reviewing reports, talking to people and specialists such as yourself. And and the drug that it's not all bad, but but the, there's a very strong emphasis that the role of HR is incredibly supportive, very collaborative, and that they know their technical stuff, and that's great. But the, the we were left with the questions of is every HR function really a trusted advisor? And when they talk about being strategic, do they really understand what that means? And and I think it encapsulate we interviewed i interviewed um the chairman of a company called kogan.com which is the the amazon equivalent in australia half a billion dollar turnover company so it's it's a big beast and i was talking to him about what he expected from hr and his perspective is i expect the same as what i would want from marketing from operations customer service whatever which is proactive challenging future focused and, and com underpinned by this commercial orientation. So I, I think we need to stop thinking of HR being HR. We've got to think that we are a support function. We know we're supportive, but now we really need to get much more commercially orientated. And, and it struck me when I worked for Conexa um, before it was taken over by IBM, we had a series of values. And one of them was called Opportunity Exists, Find It. And for me, I think that's where HR is at the moment. There are lots of opportunities with the digital transformations coming, with the need to change. Lots of opportunities are going to come out of the lockdown period. We need to find those opportunities, embrace them, and demonstrate that we are able to really put some tangible value on the bottom line, because that, unfortunately, is going to be an even more bigger priority moving forward, I think. Yeah, I've noticed that uh, during this lockdown period um, that the haves are getting more and the have-nots are getting less. And it's quite interesting is the difference as you talk about the approach that HR needs to build, HR needs to champion. And this is really an opportunity, this lockdown, to sit down and reflect where are we, uh, isn't it, uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I say you can build, you can either moan about what's happening or you can use this as an opportunity to get even stronger in many ways. Yeah, we, we've described in the book HR currently being a bit of a service station. So in other words, you can go in, you can get what you want and then you can just disappear again. Whereas what we're thinking is it should be a power station. In other words, it may not always be high profile. But when we don't have any electricity, everybody screams and shouts about it. And, and we think that the function needs to have more of a power orientation towards it in terms of, you know, standing up and really demonstrating what it can do. And, and, that's, and, and that needs courage. That, you know, that's scary. But that is scary. Yeah. But from a CEO's perspective, Dave, um, what you're saying, and Nadim, if you have a view on this as well, yeah. uh, you definitely don't want HR to be viewed as a charity case. I mean, your point is that, you know, the guy from yes. Kogan said HR yes. needs to be on the same platform yes. as everybody else. Yes. Uh, you need to pay your way, demonstrate your way. Is people analytics important for that? Because if HR doesn't demonstrate that it's paying its way, um, it is going to be absorbed and we're all going to be looking for jobs elsewhere, aren't we? Yes, very, very early on in the book, we have actually iterated or reiterated the concept of the, the um, I'd say, uh, the golden triangle, which is basically the CEO, the CFO, and the CHRO, or, or as we term it, the CPO. And the concept of people analytics, which is very different from HR analytics. Um, and I think we had this conversation earlier on with you as well, Max uh, and, and Dave, before we hit live. And the difference between HR analytics, workforce and people analytics, a lot of people don't don't kind of understand that. And we've tried to, you know, put that straight up in the book. And this is what we mean when we say people analytics. And that's how it links to the financial performance. And that's how you can, uh, I would say, you know, talk to the CEO about what change 
program people want to make. And that's how you create the impact on the business. That's really interesting. In fact, it links nicely to a question from uh, Simon Horner Long uh, from Ashdead in Surrey, if I remember correctly. Thank you, Simon, um, who asks uh, companies that need to transform their business invest too little in intangible assets. Uh, i.e. Uh, people and, and also intellectual property, et cetera. Um, how can people analytics help to shift the mindset uh, of executives to the focus? So Nadeem has answered part of that. Um, Dave, would you add anything to what Nadeem says? Yeah, I, I, I think we've got to think about what value do we add to the bottom line and how can we tangibly turn our HR practices into something that a business manager, business leader can tangibly understand? Uh, they understand money, unfortunately. It's good for the organization. So we have to start turning a lot of our practices and a lot of our activity into more financially orientated calculations. That could be at one end of the scale. We use a phrase in the book called time is money. You know, we, we, we forget about the time and the cost of time. You know, everybody's spending an hour on this. What's the cost of it? Um, what's the opportunity cost? And, and there's a number of examples in the book which are focused around um, how HR has started to say, if you think in this sort of way, an executive probably would have made a completely different decision than the one that they did, because they suddenly realized I've just wasted £100,000 because my ego didn't want to, to make the decision that I probably should have made. So I think it's about trying to quantify this and, and the activities we do into a more financially orientated way. Now, that is not easy. If it was, every organization would be doing it now. But what I'm saying is we shouldn't just stick our head you know, in, in the sand and say, let's just hope it's going to go away, because it isn't. And I do believe that this really is the key to trying to demonstrate, particularly when people are critiquing costs, budgets, et cetera, we've really got to start thinking about the value that we tangibly add. And I Brilliant. think the, the other point that I think Dave and I have, have mentioned very, um, I'd say, um, I don't have another word to say, it, but it's to speak in the language of the business. That's just one one line to say it. So how can how are HR conveying their message? And um, we know that intangibles have always been like uh, treated like costs uh, for the business. So we need to be able to speak in that language to be able to convince the business um otherwise yes otherwise it doesn't happen okay we're getting some great questions please keep the questions coming in uh mashad thank you very much memory thank you very much indeed good to see you both uh here um we can pick up questions uh at the end so guys let's uh, circle back the only reason i did simon's at the point is because it was directly uh, on the point we we're talking about but the two questions you're asking there uh, about presenting to the board and careers uh, are critical. So please keep the questions coming in, folks. Um, guys, we spoke a little bit earlier, just to get personal about writing books, about how daunting it is to write a book. It's a it's a real, I don't know, you know, you've got to write one, but to find out how difficult and how many hours and, you know, you say goodbye to your to your partner and your kids uh, and your dog, in Dave's case, uh, and, and his partner uh, for a long time. Um, how go about coming up with a structure for the book Nadim? I think this the very interesting question and something that I always talk about I think when I was writing my masters I had this kind of vision in my mind that I wanted to convert this into um, and I wanted to share it with a wider community and I think that the, the whole generic structure when I went in when I went to Dave was basically my master's research obviously a lot of that came from the knowledge that I extracted from experts like yourself and I think that was as the uh, as it evolved. We wanted it to evolve uh, as the uh, for the for the book research that, that you know how it was unfolded. And I think going to conferences with Dave's insight into the future of the work, my academic insight, and the technology evolution that that's currently happening in HR digital transformation, it we had to kind of we, we wanted to encapsulate that all into the book, which we feel uh, you know, the current disruption happening. We've, we've also covered that in some sort of sense that we knew this was happening. We didn't know it was just gonna happen right when the book was gonna be launched. Um, and I think the strong emphasis on how organizations like NHS, British Art Foundation, Sawatsky are creating communities of practice within the organization. And by communities of practice, I mean that you know, um, HR is going more agile, 
uh, they're learning new skills, um, and I think it's it's now the whole function is is uh, transforming itself. And I think we wanted to cover that through all the interviews uh, from practitioners, from executives, from the organizational data that we gathered. And I think sharing all the all all that was it it just kind of materialized as we moved forward. And I think it was just a iterative process, to be honest. Dave, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I think the, the 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 beauty from my perspective was um, we had the framework, but we were then able to share uh, what I regarded as good and not so good behaviours that I'd seen from HR. I obviously haven't named names, and I don't want to. But but what I was trying to do was to, and they they called in the book learning scenarios, and and they're just little vignettes, little stories that that have struck me that have really uh, enabled me to start to say, look, if we'd only done it this way and you'd had a slightly more data orientated approach, look at the greater value that you could have added. Look at the, the way you could have changed the conversation because, you know, numeracy and, and statistics is important, but I believe commerciality is the key to the analytical change that we're looking for. There is absolutely no point being data savvy if you have no idea about business and you can't position your questions into a business context. Otherwise, we're just asking questions for questions sake. And, and I think one of the things that we were both surprised about, although probably in reflection, we probably shouldn't have been surprised, is that we had loads of experts like yourself, Max, uh, but also loads of vendors, you know, Vizia, MHR Analytics, um, Analytics in HR, Perceptics, you know, get, were very uh, willing to give us a lot of feedback and a lot of ideas. And, and I think we've got to shout out for, for John Pensum at People Insight in Canada, who gave us um, a playbook on how to take, you know, the reality of how you change your behavior from A to B in along this journey. And CRF were, were, gave us a phenomenal amount of examples and work and the same with iSciTech uh, who were brilliant in giving me sort of advice from a people analytics specialist point of view of trying to make sure that the book still had some interest for, for some of the specialists in the field. Very nice. So when you think about the book once it's once it's been born if that's the right term for a book it does feel a bit like it. Um, what is your favorite part of the book? So for, for me, I think um, the the most favorite part of the book came at the end, which was probably the foreword written by Bernard Moore. So we were really looking forward to it. And I think that in, that kind of sums up the whole of uh, Industry 4.0 and how our book will add value to it because he, he read the whole thing and obviously getting the foreword from Bernard himself was, you know. Um, and I think the second thing, as uh, Dave has mentioned, you know, a lot of... Um, Tech companies. One of one of the tech companies that I, uh, you know, Derek Yonker, um, that I reached out to him on Crunch, and he helped us kind of uh, provide us um, a whole map for the people analytics journey, which we have we've put as the central theme and part of the book, which is very interesting because it helps organizations from go going from a very um, reporting to more of a people analytics journey on on how. They can do that. And we've basically, we took the model, but we contextualized it, put all the research that we'd found, buffed it all up, and kind of um, all HR practitioners can see where they are on the journey. And I think it's that compre comprehensive roadmap that I really enjoy. And I think that's that's what the, the value of the book is, is, is uh, to take HR practitioners from the reporting journey towards the analytics with all these organizational case studies that we've provided. So I it's about that, imposing a, a structure in some way that you like. Yes, yes. It was all, it, it, I think for me, because obviously D Dave was looking at it from a, a different perspective. I was looking at it. And that's what I think the collaboration was was very fruitful in that sense, that I was always looking at holistic case studies that I wanted to put in. Dave had had his his different case studies, obviously the, um, the, uh, the analytical insight, the reporting, uh, moving to that, and I think um, more or less, um, I think it's 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 the whole of the book that I enjoy um, together. I, I'd ask the same question to Dave. So, what's what's his favorite part? 
We've got, a, we've got a lot of questions uh, building up there. So um, I want to get, because one of them touches on something you've just said. Uh, let's just go there. Dave, what, what, what's your favourite uh, favorite part of the book? Uh, the favourite part was finishing it, okay? Because <laughs> um, I'm, a, I'm a storyteller. I'm not a writer, okay? And so to, to suddenly feel that we've, we came up with 90,000 words, for which I really still can't believe that's, that we've done, um, it is a lot of damn words. Um, I, I think for me, it's probably and, and yet it's easy to read. Well, I hope I hope so. I hope so. I, I, Matt, Max can tell that he, you've you've read the book, haven't you? Many times I've contributed to it. Contributed yes. to it. I, I think for me, it's a little bit of a legacy, really, because I I seem to have spent thirty years banging on about HR having to change. Uh, it's a little bit around the area that I see Nick Holly has asked the question of people knowing knowing it but not doing it and. And you know, thankfully, that's kept me in a in a job for a thirty years. But but we are getting to the point where we have got to make sure that HR takes that change, and it is bite sized chunks, and it's really getting away from this myth that you need to be a, a, a data geek to do this stuff. You know, there are some amazing experts you can draw on. There are people in your organization you can draw on. But you know, you have start to be got to become if you're going to become a business partner you've got to then start talking numbers because that's the world of business. So um, I, I'm just pleased about the whole thing and I, and I think it does flow quite well. And I'm pleased that both HR practitioners and analytics specialists both seem to suggest that they can get something out of it. So that's good. And, and reciprocally, well, what's the most frustrating part of the book for you, Nadim? That's a very, very good question. <laughs> that's a very good question. So I think all the, all the research and all the findings I just say HR is just not there yet. Even with the pandemic happening, I'm not seeing much. Um, I'm, I'm not really excited on what, what's happening in HR. Uh, the, the key thing to understand is like finance finance and uh, accounting have, have auditors, they have particular standards that they measure. We, do, we, di we, did, we have covered the ISO standards in the book, but now with the pandemic, all those standards seem obsolete because the way they the way you measure standards is through organizations and now we're simply in like a digital platform and how do we how do how do we now move forward and i think you know a lot of hr people are reaching out to me and saying you know why don't you give us these standards and do this and that and we'll contextualize them but the question that i ask them is that you need to have support mechanism from people outside working collaboratively and i find that missing in hr and this is this is truly frustrating because um you know, you that this is not not how the, how the profession can grow, um, and I think it, it's about uh, it's about having confidence in what HR is doing, with 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 the relationship that finance and auditors have, it just boosts their morale, creates them more confidence, and has international standards that you can gauge from one organization to another. And with HR, it's not the same. You can pick up the FTSE 100, you can pick up the NASDAQ, and you can see the different reporting standards with, with uh, human capital, which is very frustrating for anyone uh, who's, who's, uh, who's, who's uh, probably a researcher or understands this, these uh, technical aspects of human capital and intangibles. And of course, a lot of that work comes from the, the, the master of the trade, who is um, Anthony Hesketh. Yes, exactly. Yes, a lot. I've learned a lot from Anthony Heskett. Uh, great guy for anybody who's listening today. Uh, go and look up some of uh, Ant Heskett's work from uh, University of Lancaster. We're just about to get into some questions. I've got one last question uh, for you, Dave, before we turn to other people's questions. Um, looking at the whole field, what's the most encouraging elements that you're finding? Um. <sighs> Obviously, I, I do believe the commercial credibility of HR still needs to be to, still needs to be worked on. I, I guess the thing that is encouraging is that when you talk about the commerciality and you share tips and talk people through how to start thinking about shifting their their focus from just doing stuff to actually trying to integrate numbers into their dialogue with their clients, etc., people are very they're very willing to do it. The thing is, does it stick? And, and, and I think the encouraging thing is definitely people are very responsive and very willing to do it. But the, the, the dilemma is that this is not an easy transition to make. 
You know, that's why I think chapter nine in the book is probably the best bit, because John Pensum, as I said, from People Insight, has shared his playbook and it's really broken it down from how do I report on myself about how I do stuff and how I start to work through with experts and all this sort of stuff. I, I think the recent crisis we're going through has just reiterated the power of data. Everybody's looking at at numbers, trends. What's the stats saying? What what? How much this have we got? How much have we done that, of that? So I, I think the data movement is not going to go away, but people analytics alone is not going to transform HR. It's down to the practitioners to actually behaviorally, behaviorally change. And that is, as we know, one of the critical and most challenging things for anybody to do. Very nice. OK, folks, if you want to send uh, a few questions and we'll go through those. Uh, Marshall, I want to come to your question towards the end, because I think it's such an all embracing question uh, about careers. Um, let's go to uh, memories, which is an extension of some stuff that we've already spoken about. Um, memory in GUI asks, um, how do we present the performance of HR to the board? Uh, using business indicators, um, you know, profits and sales. What's the best way to present HR and analytics to to boards and uh, executive committees, etc.? But my, my perspective would be uh, obviously we currently do it through dashboards with you know various you know particular graphs, charts, and whatever, and that's all very interesting. But I think we need to ask the question: how much of what we actually present is interesting to the board? because it always tends to be very focused on HR. I think it's back to what I said earlier. How can we how can we translate what we do into a more commercial um, area of interest? So, for example, if we're doing, you know, a recruitment campaign, what's the difference between the high performers and the OK performers? What is it that the outliers are doing? What is it? What is it that the engagement survey is telling us that from a data point of view that in higher engagement is linked to higher team performance or higher productivity. So I think what we've got to do is that, you know, we probably still need to report our dashboards and show people exactly, you know, where we're at from an HR operational point of view. But if we want to be strategic, whatever that means, we have got to become more commercial. And I think we've got to try and translate some of these things into particular projects, particular activities, which, undoubtedly involve language that they understand which will be for productivity customer income customer retention and and obviously income and profitability thanks dave can i, um, can I answer that question yes well? yes of course thank you i think it i think it all starts with business strategy um the the initial part is for 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 hr to understand the business strategy we've we've outlined this in chapter 10 and obviously that links to the future of work, which is now currently happening, which, I, which I'm telling people. I've written recently written an article on, on Entrepreneur about the now of work. And I say this, that HR need to understand uh, the strategic workforce planning, the capability, the KPIs that they've set, uh, that the board already looks at the probably, I'd say, what are the, what are the indicators that they're looking at? And then gauge, uh, I think it's working uh, backwards as well and I think Dave's mentioned this is to take the employee feedback into the mechanism take the employee experience into the mechanism take all the data that you can but not using too much data to, to data overload yourself but it I think it all starts with what the strategy what the vision what the mission of the business is where you're heading and I think that's what's missing uh, which Dave says it's the commerciality it's the same thing the way that I look at it is you need to understand what the business is trying to achieve Excellent. Um, guys, are we okay to go through till the top of the hour, Dave, Nadim? Yeah, 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 yeah. We're done. Excellent. Um, I want to uh, ask a couple of themes that have come up um, on the relationship of uh, people analytics to development. Uh, Saba asked a question uh, about that and a couple of other people have mentioned as well. What about what about people analytics and L and D, learning and development? How is there a relationship? Can people analytics help in your view? Um, well, with it, I think if if you look at all of the um, sub functions that make up the HR community, learning and development, I think is probably unfortunately a bit lagging behind, um, which is a bit of a shame when you think that you know it's uh, it's had all sorts of. ROI modeling done by was it Jack Phillips years and years ago um, 
but so so I I definitely think that there is a critical need for L and D to to get into the world of analytics, particularly as the future of work is going to drive a need for people to change their skill set, new learnings, and everything else. And we need to be able to measure what where they were and where they ended up, and which particular method of learning is the most effective. So. At most definitely from a personal point of view, I, I think that's really vital because that will change the way that people will learn and also will change the way in which organisations provide a suite of learning to, to employees. I mean, the amount that companies are spending on learning and indeed in e-learning, um, I saw figures for the US recently, was well over 30 or 40 billion um, and, and that spend is going to be increasing. Um, yeah. there's a great question here, and I would expect I, I think no, no less from uh, Littel uh, Shama Haim, uh, who asks, will people analytics remain human? Um, will we still need analysts in HR as automation in the field moves forward? And that's from uh, Littel in Tel Aviv. So um, is analytics going to become automated in the are we still going to have jobs I think yes yes we're, we're we're still going to have jobs and I I think I'm of the view that you know a lot of the function a lot of the uh, things will become um, I, I say automated but I think it's the human intellect that needs to be addressed here we need to we need to for HR we need to understand what the data is saying and how we can interpret the data. It's eventually, we've mentioned this in the book and we, we, we say this very out loud that I think intelligence is the highest form um, of, uh, I think wisdom is the highest form of intelligence. I'd, I'd say that in that way, it's about how you interpret the data and that's what our book is trying to do. That's what we're trying to put in front of the HR is you will only become obsolete unless you don't understand what the data is saying. So obviously we know machine learning and artificial intelligence is coming whether we like it or not, but you will only be replaced when you don't know how to use that data, how to interpret it and how to probably share that data in the right way, in the right language and become more commercially savvy with, with that. And that's the that's the reason for writing the whole book. And, and I think also building on that is if, if we're going down a more automated or augmented analytics route where, you know, computers can talk to you and do all this thinking that, they're supposedly able to do. Um, I, I think the role of HR, which we've described, we've described the future HR practitioner, and it's got six areas to it. And one of the most critical one is as a data and analytics translator. And we've used the word translator because that's been used in a number of different articles. But it also reflects what we want is that it may be that you're not the person that's done the analysis, but you damn well need to be able to translate the results whether they're future looking or backward looking into an insight that makes sense for the business to be able to action. So I, I think that, that we will need HR practitioners to become more analytical and more numerically savvy and data savvy. Will they need to be able to do all this stuff? Maybe the machines will do that grunt work for us. Yes. And that's I think, the role of the, the people analytics leader. We, we're seeing a lot of this trend um, I think come in 2020, especially a lot of people are being hired as people analytics leaders. And I think more, more of the, the competencies or the capabilities that they have is around understanding this data and being able to help the organization by garnering those insights that we see from all these different uh, technology uh, and, and helping the business move forward. Not necessarily that they, they know, they, they've got a team of stats and a team of specialists working for them, but they're the people who are leading the teams. And I think that's what the positioning of HR should be. Guys, there are quite, quite a few questions. Dave, I just want to try and get through yeah, because we've got a couple of minutes left and, and questions are coming in, which is fantastic, folks. Please keep them going. And we will arrange another session uh, to do a, a QA and a if necessary for the overflow. But I want to get through a few of these. A lot of people are asking, um, we had initially the question from Marshad and a couple of others, careers in people analytics um, what are the future of people analytics careers or what are the best courses to take if one wants to learn uh, people analytics for example you guys were thinking of running some sort of trainings at some point yes 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 that's, we, that's, that's an interesting we, question that we'd like to hmm. explore yeah, yeah I, tell I, us I, about it go for it 
Dave, yeah. <laughs> do, do you want to say something or should I? You go. Okay, so what we, were, what we were planning to do is after this session, if we had a good response, which we do have already, Alhamdulillah. So we, we wanted to, uh, I think, partner up and collaborate with, with Max again to do like two more sessions, follow-up sessions, and kind of take a deep dive into the book. And these sessions are, are not going to be charged. They're, they're complimentary. But I think one of the um, I, th I think one of the aspects that we we wanted to build was to create like a community of people who uh, would probably share uh, the knowledge that they've got and direct them towards uh, this community that we're trying to build. Can you can you reiterate what I'm saying, Dave? <laughs> in in a simpler language. Yeah, no, we, 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 we just think that the book has some outlines which could be quite helpful for HR practitioners who are wanting to go on that journey of trying to become more comfortable with data, um, as Nick Holly says, of actually not just talking about it, but actually doing it. So helping people and enabling you to feel a little bit more comfortable about that numbers are not scary they're actually there to help you and, and i think also to also very clearly know the boundary as to when you need to ask an expert to help you so you know the, the world of predictive analytics gives some amazing stuff okay and it and it they're very powerful we're not saying that an hr practitioner should be thinking like that but we need to get you into a place where you understand when you can ask for help how to ask for help and then more importantly how you turn that help into something that is meaningful for the business and we were hoping that some of the sessions that we would think about may well help people to get some ideas and some learnings from that and uh, dave what about careers for people in people analytics this is must be on a lot of people's minds yeah. what's the best way to 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 develop your career uh, to move forward what are the different types of roles etc I, I it's a, it's a great it's a really interesting question because i i'd almost answer it with a question of do you want to stay within the hr community or the people function community that that's almost the key question because in, in the book, there's a lot of data that looks at capability of HR, and, and I won't sort of blow what happened, but it, it, it's not full of a lot of positives. Give away the twist at the end, you mean? Yeah, but one of the things that did come out is that, you know, the best HR practitioners were those who had a zigzag career. In other words, they had a commercial orientation, went back into HR, had another commercial role, went back into HR. I can see that the role of people analytics specialists undoubtedly enables you to get exposed to business information and business data. So it could be that you may need to think about, you know, maybe you have to do a similar zigzag type of career from a specialist into a business role, then back into a specialist role. Because, you know, the people analytics career only seems to have probably three roles in it, you know, an, an analyst, you know, an HR analytics practitioner, and then head of function. Yeah. Uh, there doesn't seem to be very much more there within it. So I, I would stand back and look more at the bigger, are you interested in staying in HR or are you using this as a route to go into an analytics role, which could be, you know, marketing, could be finance, could be a whole host of more numerically orientated at roles and activities. Dave, we've got a lot of, and Nadim, we've got a lot of people um, listening today who seem to be, interested in entering the people analytics uh, profession. I nearly said game, but perhaps that's not the right. Yeah, yeah I thought you um, might. What, yeah. what, what are the entry points? How does one get into people analytics? What are, what are the options? I think to my, to my surprise, um, there aren't many courses offered by the CIPD at the moment on human capital. And I think there are a couple of, a uh, couple of, I'd say companies, organizations, not taking any names, at this point in time, but they are offering uh, HR analytics courses. I think people analytics is is very, um, I would say, it is is evolving at this point in time. So it's 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 commercial as as we're speaking. You know, every day there's new insights happening, and probably with with the current pandemic, we're going to see more of it with organizational network analysis and all these other new things, terminologies, and augmented. Uh, I think that was a. a we were just writing about, I think it was artificial, uh, I forgot the name recently, but it, there's so many things happening 
that you know the the whole profession is evolving and i think it's there, there isn't one entry point as dave has mentioned i think it's it's being more cross functional understanding the business and and asking yourself why do you want to be a people analytics mm -hmm. uh, you know come into the people analytics function or the or or become a people analytics leader so that's 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 what what it is but i think um again you know the follow up sessions might help you help people who are uh, who want to enter the profession so i'd recommend them their free sessions if they are, if they want to want to understand more they they um they join us on the sessions and would would be glad to help them as much as we can one theme that's coming up um, and i think your book touches on it directly because you've made such a strong point that you don't need to be a deep statistical or, or maths expert to be a very effective in people analytics what about this perceived lack of analytical capability in hr functions today uh, do you have a view do you think it's true uh, if it is true what should be done about it if anything at all and so on um i <laughs> In the book, there's a, there's a couple of things that, that from data, um, numerical reasoning tests. We had about fifteen hundred people took a test, and um, you know the average was below where below below the mean, below the median as to where we would expect to be. But in actual fact, when you look at problem solving and analytical capability, probably we're pretty sound. So I, I think it's the fact that people are scared by numbers. You know, I didn't join HR because I like numbers or, or I didn't join HR because I like technology. Well, that's the future of HR, I'm afraid. And, and you know, that's a bit harsh. But I I, I, I think there is a way of doing it. And, and uh, you know, we, we whether it's going through, you know, a, a playbook together, whether it's working with a, a mentor to help you, whether it's job shadowing to go and see what somebody is doing and how it's done. I, I think we really do need to think very seriously about the whole data and analytics translator role you know and if you look at you know the covid 19 i think hr is going to have to really you know navel gaze at where it's at and what it's going to do because there are going to be some huge challenges for the majority of organizations out there large small and and uh, you know smes small medium enterprises so i i, I think hr is really going to have to up its game yes. and uh, i do believe that the the data and analytics route is one way of helping them to do that. And remember, you don't necessarily have to do it yourself. You can bring people in to help you to do it. You know, you can buy, you can either build, you can buy, or you can borrow. And so, you know, you need to think of different ways of getting access to that activity. Um, I mean, that leads to something that uh, Sean Harrington, hi, Sean, um, has asked, uh, and, and she, it says, do you think the accelerated workplace changes we've seen during COVID-19 and the speed of pivoting that has occurred have helped to start shifting the HR mindset? Now, you're suggesting um, that an HR shift in mindset is necessary, Dave. Um, are we seeing that shift in HR? Is it too short for us to be seeing it? What do you um, need to do um, as a result? Yeah, research came out yesterday from Red Thread Research. They've just done some work looking at the use of analytics in the COVID um, um, crisis. And the focus was regrettably on reporting and descriptive analytics, which is, you know, what's happening historically. You know, where realistically we should be looking in a more future orientated in a more yes. predictive way. And so far, you would need to get some expertise in to help you to do that. But HR should be asking those sorts of questions. You know, what, what's the risk profile of our workforce? Where, where are the people that are going to work? Where are they not going to work? Who wants to do more remote working? So we need to be really on a proactive stance here because yes. this is an opportunity. Um, it's yes. not a risk to HR, but if we don't do something quickly, then it will become a risk because the last thing I want is HR to be outsourced. Yes, folks. Okay, last point, Nadim. Yeah, I think previously we were looking. We were HR was trying to find the business question, and today we 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 know what the business question is. We know what the burning question is. Um, a lot of HR I'm seeing. You know, a lot of people are reaching out, and and LinkedIn. I've got like ten thousand connections. Um, HR is currently, I think, piled up on furloughs. Instead of doing that, they should be looking at how they can look at the competency. What the future of the workforce would look like obviously everything's now changing and how are we as organizations going to adapt to it i think 
as um, you know, have more of a systems thinking approach of what, and, and we've mentioned that, you know, the systematic disruption that has taken place, it's a global disruption. It's not that it's happened to your HR department or my HR department or someone else's company, it has happened throughout. So I think it's, uh, as Dave has mentioned, get help. Um, and I think collaborate would be the right word rather than get help. I think collaboration with, with a wider, um, I would say uh, the wider community of what HR is currently doing, where HR is going, and and what the future of the work would would look like is very important for HR today. And just one final quick point to, to back that up is that in the book we've got examples from AstraZeneca, from King, I think Svarsky even talk about it as well. In that there is a lot of focus upon upskilling HR, and it it can be done. It takes time, it takes effort, and it takes focus, but it can be done. So I think it's just, that's, this is the last thing that HR does. Yeah, is focus on other people, but they don't focus on them, themselves. Yeah. That's a very uh, that's a very astute insight, Nadine. Um, as was your 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 view as we come to the end um, about the systemic approach, and I and I think the message that I'm getting from from you, and particularly from the book, which um, just to reiterate for the third time that it's a non-technical approach to HR, is that perhaps the way we need to frame people analytics in the future then is to say, it's more about asking the right questions than about being a technical genius to come up with the right answers. The yes. right answers, you can get any number of analysts to come in and do that. Yes. Asking the right question, I think, is a, is a central message. Uh, yes. So I want to thank you both uh, very much. Um, Nadim, what do people need to do? There's a lot of interest in masterclasses, uh, in continuing uh, the dialogue, the conversation. What? How do you guys want to uh, speak to to your to your fan club? Because you are now authors. Thank you, thank you. I th I think the first the first uh, we're we're focusing HR is focusing on a lot of reporting data at this point in time. I think you've mentioned and Dave has mentioned the recent research that has come out. And I think we want to we want to um, we're we're interested highly to collaborate with people who are looking at the data from their HRIS systems and are on their analytics journey. We're highly interested to help them. Um, one of the things they can reach out to us through LinkedIn, through Twitter, um, through Facebook. I think we're all we're we're all on social media. Uh, the names are up over here. We also have a we we also have a book launch code, which if you haven't ordered. You can order from from Kogan page, so this is the book launch code that they can uh, that, that they can order from. Is that and scrolling they, across the banner at the bottom? Yes, it's it's coming yeah. across the banner at the bottom, and okay. if they order before May, they can get a free ebook um, and with 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 the printed copy of the book. I think that's that's uh, and I think uh, we're, we're happy to give free follow up sessions. Um, I think it's important to connect and have conversations with where people are. And those conversations would lead them probably uh, to the next level uh, of helping their HR team. I think it's, it's all about upskilling yourself before you start with the organization. I think it's to look at, look at, have a, have a, have, have a, have, I think a, a reflective approach is what I would, would want to say for HR. At this point. Dave, anything that you want to add to that? Well, I, th I think that that's that's exactly wh where we're at. I, I think we we do need to um, decide what was the best question because we have um, we do, we do. a copy of the book here, which um, we um, have got. That's saying that must be them, I think, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> really I think just received the first call. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Um, so I, I was thinking, I thought Simon Horn gave uh, some really good questions around shifting the ex mindset of exec. So I was thinking Simon's was the best person. Simon Horn along, you are apparently the lucky winner, Simon Horn along. Of, uh, so Simon, if you want to send me a message on LinkedIn of your address, I'll make sure we get the book across to you. If you want it signed by both of us, we'll, we'll, have, we'll find some way of doing that. Wonderful. Everybody, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. We're going to run some more sessions. Um, I can see there are a lot of questions, a lot of interesting input. Thank you so much for your time uh, yeah. and for joining us and for thinking so hard about questions to ask. As a warm thank you both to Nadim and Dan for spending so much time writing the book and for sharing your wealth of knowledge. Thanks very much, guys, and see you all soon, I hope. Thank you thank for your time, Max. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Stay safe. Thank you. I know.